Hello, BookTube. I had an appointment bitterly early this morning, first thing this morning, senior hours. And by the time it was done, uh, two things were true. Number one, the Brattle Bookshop, just up the street, was open for business. And number two, I badly wanted to go to the Brattle Bookshop and just wander around for a bit. Uh, the timing was right. I got there right as, as they were opening. And uh, the timing is also right because Boston is staring down the barrel of another heat wave longer than the last one, uh, which doesn't so much make browsing at the, bat at the brattle impossible, but it makes going and coming very uncomfortable on the subway. So uh, probably I will just hang out with the bean while the, while the Boston temperatures soar perilously close to triple digits Fahrenheit uh, for the whole of the long weekend. Uh, the, uh, it's, today is the last the last reasonable day after this it's going to be uh, high 80s and then mid 90s mid 90s mid 90s mid 90s Fahrenheit for who knows how long so so and I don't have grounds to complain uh, because a I love the heat and B the rest of the country is broiling under a gigantic heat dome what what the meteorologists refer to as a heat dome and also uh, the the hurricane Hurricane Alley is starting to act up, so uh, I don't have grounds to complain at all, but uh, I probably won't be doing any great expeditions of any kind, so I went to the Brattle. Uh, it felt a little bit odd to do, as I imagine it now always will, because a month ago or a month or so ago I put out a call on this channel for ebooks, for you to send me ebooks. I did it, or maybe it was more than a month ago, I, I did it in conjunction with getting uh, a Kindle. I got a uh, Kindle Paperwhite uh, and thought, you know, not only do I love reading ebooks on a handheld device, but I'm doing more and more of it because traditional publishers aren't the publishers that used to send we, we on this channel. We used to get 10 books a day in the mail, and those don't happen anymore. Uh, people aren't in the warehouses, they aren't at their offices, there's nothing like that. I get tons and tons of new books, but I get them as e copies which means a whole lot more e-reading. Uh, so I got a Kindle Paperwhite because it had been, I had read all of the reviews and all of the, the talk about the Paperwhite as being really easy on the eyes. Uh, and in conjunction with that, I put out a call to all of you to, if you have EPUB files, it, uh, PDFs and Mobi don't seem to behave as well, but, uh, but EPUB files, uh, tend to work really well for me. They tend to open really well on my computer. Uh, it turns out that uh, it, sorry, in addition to everything else, I also have a massive allergy attack. <laughs> Just massive. Uh, it, it, it turns out that, that uh, much as I like the Paperwhite, the, the, the central selling feature of the thing is actually a detriment to me. It's the central one of the central selling features of the Kindle Paperwhite. In addition to the fact that the e-ink is easier on your eyes, is that it's distraction-free reading. It's not a web browsing machine. It's just a dedicated e-reader. You load the files onto the machine, and then all you can do on it is read. The Kindle uh, Paperwhite that I got uh, has a very rudimentary web browser that's not convenient to get to, and intentionally so. It's meant you're meant to concentrate on your reading. Uh, but that is actually a detriment for me because I read critically. I read a lot of the books that I read. I read uh, mentally preparing for a review, and that means that I'm taking notes. And the notes aren't just a question of, "Oh, I really like this line." The the notes are, "Wait a minute, what what does this remind me of?" And then I want to go and find the thing it reminds me of get the exact attribution information and put that in my note. Go back to the book and put that in my note. This is an echo of so-and-so from 30 years ago. Uh, and I can't do that on, uh, on a paperwhite. And I can do it on an iPad, of course. An iPad is a media consumption device, I believe is the current clunky col euphemism. Uh, and I can do that on an iPad, in addition to which reading on an iPad for endless stretches of time, endless hours, doesn't put a strain on my eyes at all. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't bother me at all in the way that I've, I've heard. I heard so many testimonials from so many of you about your Kindle Paperwhites, how it was the best per, 
purchase that you had made in forever of any kind and that it revamped your reading life just made removed your eye strain uh, and I, I heard about that in a lot of uh, reviews that I watched ahead of time on YouTube but uh, I don't seem to experience that, that same kind of eye strain. I've been reading on these these glass and plastic devices for a decade now, and I love it. I absolutely love the experience. I love it. It is so nice to just have this this graceful, handy thing that you can just you can just lose yourself in a book. You can just read, take all the notes you want, never have to worry about uh, anything really. You don't have to worry about the condition. You don't have to worry about losing your place. You don't have to worry about storage or anything like that. All you have to worry about is an, an electric current. <laughs> and I remember when I was working in Barnes and Noble, when I was working in the bookstore, uh, for a while I was selling the Barnes and Noble Nook, the very first, the very, the very first iteration of the Barnes and Noble Nook, which I just read the other day. Barnes and Noble is not going to sell anymore. Uh, I would sell. I would sell those. I would. I would prowl around those tables because they seem to get customer traffic, and that's all I wanted was customer traffic. All I wanted was to talk to, talk to customers. If I had to learn about nooks and sell them, then I would do that. Uh, and I used to have customers come up to me and say, well, "Well, what if my electricity goes out?" And I would say, "Well, you know, it'll be back." And they'd say, "Well, what if it goes out forever?" <laughs> I'd say, "Well, if it goes, if your electricity goes out forever." You're going to have more problems on your hands than just what the fact that you can't read your electronic books. <laughs> You're not going to be doing any reading if your electricity goes out forever because the world will be ending. It's ridiculous to even think about it. Maybe for a long trip somewhere, but uh, no, I I absolutely love it. But I'm I'm loving it on my uh, my iPad. I have a, a Barnes and Noble Nook, a 10-inch Barnes and Noble Nook, and just recently I. I was naughty and ordered yet another tablet and it should be here any day. We'll talk about that. But in the, so it felt a little strange to go to the Brattle sale lot. The Brattle, those of you don't maybe don't know, uh, the Brattle is a used bookstore here in Boston and they have, in addition to being a used bookstore, a great used bookstore, they also have a huge outdoor sale lot of one dollar, three dollar, and five dollar books that are on, they're not organized in any way and they are, those carts are full of treasures and they are re, they are restocked all the time, every day, so it's, it's a, a playground for a, a bookworm <laughs> uh, and it, feel, it feels a little strange to go to those shelves and, and just sort of prowl around and pick at the books because I have so many ebooks now thanks to your generosity. I've had about 10 of you that have really taken it to heart to, to load me with books of all kinds from your collections. Tremendously generous, tremendous fun. Uh, but I did find a stack of books anyway, <laughs> even though, because I don't have to keep these things, right? It's fun to shop for them. It's fun to see all these old friends of mine. It was certainly fun this morning to have a distraction. So, so I don't need to keep any of these. You never know. The goal, of course, with any used book shopping will be uh, only keepers, only things that will stay in the collection forever, but it's not necessary. So the first two things I got are murder mysteries. Uh, the beginning of 2020, the very beginning of 2020, I was hugely loving murder mysteries. I was reading one every day and it was so much fun. And I was learning a lot, too. I was learning a lot about the mystery genre, and I was learning a lot about uh, a whole bunch of mystery writers that I had never experienced before. And then uh, the pandemic really struck Massachusetts re really bad, so that, so that I was looking at the, uh, the state website for new confirmed cases every day, and it was just through the roof and looked to have no end in sight. It looked like the end of the world. The, 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 the state government was scrambling to figure out what to do. Businesses were shutting down left and right. Uh, and suddenly the, something about that put me off reading about murders, <laughs> what it is. Uh, and shamefully, uh, the yen to read those murder mysteries has gradually started re returning now that Boston's numbers are good, relatively good, for the pandemic, even though 90% of the rest of the country, the numbers are awful. In fact, much worse than what they were initially in March in, my, in Boston. Uh, so I shouldn't, I, out of fellow feeling for all the different United States where I have lived and where I know people, I should still be off my feed with murder mysteries, but 
I guess these disinclinations are local <laughs> because I've been I found a couple of murder mysteries that I want to explore both of which are, are authors I don't think I've ever read uh, the first one is Dorothy Simpson and this is a Luke Thanet um, mystery called Six Feet Under in just a mass market paperback and I read the back the back says that picturesque Nettleton was a typical English country village with nosy parkers peeking through every curtained window and secrets behind every cottage door I thought a lot of the mysteries that I read at the beginning of the year and really liked were English country village mysteries where where the detective superintendent or whatever doesn't think there's much to the case and it turns out there's all sorts of darkness lurking under the surface I, I started out that trend with Murder Unlimited by George Ed Heyer and loved it just loved it even though the ending was utterly ridiculous the ending of the book is just just silly six different kinds of silly layers of silly uh, but I loved the setting I love the, the uh, clear affection that it brings out in the writer so when I read that I grabbed this and then I, I saw this thing here this is oddly shaped trade paperback uh, uh, the Killings at Badger's Drift by Carolyn Graham, who's an author I don't think I've ever read. This is another murder mystery author I don't think I've ever read. And when I read the jacket, the jacket was, Badger's Drift is an ideal English village, <laughs> complete with vicar, bumbling local doctor, and kindly spinster with a nice with a nice line in homemade cookies. So, at, at random, two murder mysteries that are set in ideal English country villages. So we'll see how those go. I'll pop them down like candy, so these, they aren't exactly... Dostoevsky so, so we'll see if if these turn out to be favorites uh, those aren't the only fiction but they come awful close <laughs> they come awful close uh, then the, these next two are uh, UK trade paperback military history and I love UK trade paperbacks just think they're fantastic and I don't think I've ever had this one this is Arjun Subramaniam who was a, a fighter pilot an Indian fighter pilot and also a air mar I think when he retired he was air marshal of India's air uh, air defense forces and this is his book India's Wars a military history 1947 to 1971 uh, this is uh, UK Harper Collins and I've seen this book referenced a million times in other works in smaller subjects smaller focuses uh, but I don't think I've ever read the whole of this book so that was fantastic to find it these are all dirt cheap these are all from the bargain lot uh, and the next one is also something, also a UK. This is from Alan Lane, I believe. Uh, yeah, this is from Alan Lane. And I love UK trade paperbacks. I just love the way they sit in the hand. The extra heft of the paper, the, the crappy binding. I just love it all. And this is an author I have read. Uh, but again, this is probably his masterpiece, and I haven't read it. And it's on my mind lately. This is Jason Burke, and this is The 9-11 Wars. His big book on... The, the, on 9-11, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the lead up to them, and the long aftermath. Uh, and he wrote The Road to Kandahar, which is, uh, I thought was fantastic. And he also wrote a book on the Taliban, on Al-Qaeda, that was great. And uh, I learned about it through somebody at the Brattle, one of the, one of the, the employees at the Brattle. I, I wanted to know, years ago, I wanted to know, what can you show me of... Uh, uh, on Al Qaeda, what what do is there a really good book that doesn't have a lot of jingoism or sensationalism? And that that Brattle employee recommended this guy, and that Al Qaeda book was fantastic. Uh, but not, I don't think I've ever read this. And I I uh, just finished a reread, hip deep 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 in the sources of uh, a new book um, on the Iraq War, and Jason Burke was. Uh, much like Christopher Hitchens, he was defender of the Iraq War, at least in humanitarian terms. He, if, he, if he didn't concern himself with the politics, then, then he was willing to say to anybody who would listen that it was a good thing to depose, to, to topple Saddam Hussein from power was a good thing to do. Uh, he writes, uh, one little bit of this that I have read is at the very beginning, and I like it, because uh, uh, it's it's self-deprecating in a way that great reporters often aren't. Uh, this book remains, however, primarily a work of journalism and not of history. It, its aims, in the long tradition of reportage, to reveal and communicate something about the world and about key events through the voices and views of those who participate in them and are affected by them. Its main aim is to provoke and inform discussion of vital questions rather than confidently lay out certitudes. 
as the as new material becomes available, others will improve the accounts of many of the events contained in the pages that follow. Overall, I have tried to catch something of the nature of the conflict that has gripped and affected billions of people in recent years. And then he finishes with this, which I always tugs at me. Uh, Watching the aerial bomba- bombing of Tora Bora in the mountains of eastern Afghanistan in December of 2001, with vapor trails from B-52s slicing across the pale sky above the snowy peaks and row upon row of rocky ridges successively lit by the slanting rising sun. A fellow journalist commented on it as a scene of untold horror and violence and extraordinary aesthetic beauty unfolded before us, that only a vast novel could really make sense of what was happening. He was probably right. And yet, to the best of my knowledge, such a vast novel has not happened yet. Uh, so I, I, And I don't think if you were a journalist, I don't think you would make that kind of a mention right at the beginning of your book if you weren't planning on doing your level best to write a great novel in journalistic form. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I just finished... Uh, I'm, I'm deep in the Iraq War again, <laughs> much, much to my mental detriment very much to my mental detriment uh but i'm reviewing a book and there are a couple more down the line so this is the, i mean it's in perfect right time for me to find this and read it uh then this next one is the only other piece of fiction aside from the murder mysteries uh it's a hardcover of a great novel again the author's masterpiece this is ivan klima great czech writer ivan klima this is judge on trial uh his big book translated into english uh, by A.G. Brain. <laughs> Can you imagine having that name? A.G. Bra- a good brain. Uh, and this is this is a, just I've written on this novel before. I absolutely love it. I'm not sure if I if this is its only English translation. If it is, then I must have read Brain's translation. Uh, I can't. I never have a good memory for remembering translators. But this is this is there's a crime at, in in. Soviet occupied Prague and a judge is called upon to sit on the case and it the title comes from the fact that it, the powers that be are watching him carefully and that he is on trial as well and but it's so much more than that I mean that is a main plot that runs throughout a huge chunk of the book but it, there's so much more going on here there's uh, the whole world and everything in it is pulled into this book it is amazing an amazing work uh, and I haven't read it in 10 years more than that so I, uh, when I saw it at the battle, I also, I, I, I also, I grabbed it anyway. I would have grabbed it anyway. But this has a recipe card for uh, Tahitian marinated fish. So, so you know how to make Tahitian marinated fish, and also this has uh, somebody tucked in the back here, blueprints. No idea why. I'll examine them. I'll find out what they are and, and uh, maybe maybe get a clue as to who owned this book before I did. But uh, it's an odd combination. A, a recipe card for fish, for marinated Tahitian fish, and a set of blueprints. Uh, but I want I want the book anyway, so, so, so I grabbed it. Then this next one is a, uh, a trip down memory lane, because I had this book once upon a time and loved it. This is from Oxford. This is the Oxford Dictionary of Phrase, Saying, and Quotation. Uh, which tracks down and gives you the definitive derivation of all of those things that you think you know. You think you know where they come from. And it breaks it down into categories. It's these these Oxford books, uh, these dictionaries, there's a phrase, saying, a quotation, there's anecdote, there's literary quotations, and they are full of material, but they're also a huge amount of each of these books is indexes and cross-references vitally so, so that you can find what you're looking for in these books. I once had a whole bunch of these on my reference shelf when I worked before the internet. When you needed a reference shelf of a handful of key books that you were going to use over and over and over again. And I, so I had, I had a, a big dictionary, I had a little dictionary, I had a visual dictionary, um, uh, and I had phrase books and derivation books so that I knew uh, if I was looking for that one particular thing, or if I saw something echoed and I wanted to find out where it came from and chase it down, I love these sorts of things. Just love, I love browsing through them just idly. Uh, so, although I don't have that reference desk anymore, the internet is my reference desk now. I grabbed it anyway. Uh, and then uh, you might be wondering, since this, this Brattle Book Hall is well along here, you might be wondering where's biography? I 
biography is my favorite kind of reading. It's my favorite kind of book. There have been 80 billion of them, so you always find biographies at the Brattle. Uh, and I did find a couple. We'll finish out with the two biographies I got. The first one is a writer's biography. It is not an action biography at all. It's a, an author biography. It's by Jeremy Lewis, and it's a biography of Cyril Connolly, uh, the great critic, one of the great princes of my own profession. Uh, who <laughs> the the book starts off, if I remember correctly, the book starts off with a horrifying quote. If you're if you're in my line of work, was, this is Cyril Connolly writing to John Russell, saying, "What is there to say about someone who did nothing all his life but sit on his bottom and write reviews?" <laughs> Uh, but I, uh, Lewis is really good at the beginning. I want to read you the, his opening chapter, his opening paragraph here, uh, because he's really good. And I've, I, I have read chunks of this book. I haven't read the whole thing, uh, but I've loved how beautifully written it is. So, uh, but he, I tend to agree with his opening paragraph here. Boswell accepted. I have never been a great reader or admirer of literary biographies. Always, always been encouraging me to read the beginning of an 800-page literary biography. I far prefer the first to secondhand the immediacy and intimacy of the autobiography and memoir, prone as they are to exaggeration, imperfect recollection, blatant prejudice, and unashamed untruths. And yet, by some curious irony, writing this particular literary life proved one of the most enjoyable things I have ever done. Much of this, I suspect, has to do with Cyril Connolly himself. Writers, as a rule, should be read and not read about. Not because one wants to shield them from prying eyes, though often as not literary biographies are read and probably written as a form of respectable gossip, but because, contrary to popular imaginings, writers' lives are often dull. Austere affairs, a matter of long hours put in behind the typewriter, washed down with a good deal of drink and enlivened by the odd flurry of infidelity. <laughs> Unlike the rest of us, the most diligent among them, W. H. Auden, for instance, know where they, they want to go and pursue their calling with the dedication and single-mindedness reserved for those who achieve great things in life in whatever sphere of activity. Uh, and you're not going to get far away from that kind of a sentiment wh when you're writing about Cyril Connolly because he did nothing but write his whole life. That, that opening quote about sitting on his bottom and writing reviews ended up being most of what he did. Uh, so a long literary biography of a fellow critic, uh, that it's high time, high time I read the whole thing, high time that I kept a copy. And the last book, the, the second biography, is a man of action, <laughs> who did not live to old age and who was not sitting on his bum all day writing reviews. And I have had this, this is a fantastic biography, just great, and I have had it many times and every time I give it away. Every time I mention it on this channel, I've mentioned it twice on this channel, both times, somebody has, has uh, popped up from the front row and said, can I, could you, would you maybe send me that? Uh, and I'm going to try not to do that this time because I'd like to hold on to this. Uh, and also because it, it's, you know, I'm more and more wary of sending things in the mail. It's, it takes a lot of bother now when in the pandemic. Uh, but this is uh, Willard Stern Randall, and this is his biography of Ethan Allen, a very, a very young and forgotten founding father of, of, of uh, the United States. Uh, and uh, Randall does an amazing job in this book in, in just learning everything there is to know about Alan's family life, about all of his adventures that, that aren't the typical things you get in the one paragraph summary of this person. This is a nuts and bolts biography of the first order, and, and it's got this great cover. That statue is, is Ethan Allen's statue in the Hall of Statues in the U.S. Capitol, the United States Capitol, which I'm not 100% I'm not sure. I always wonder about this. I, there was always the, the Hall of Statues, was, that's all it was, it was just wall after wall after wall after wall of statues of Americans, some whom have name recognition like Ethan Allen, plenty of whom do not. Uh, and I, that was always my favorite place to go in the capital. I would always, often spend a long amount of time there. I have actual uh, photographs of this of this statue, among many many others. Uh, but I always wonder when I when I see this or when I hear a reference to the U.S. Capitol, I, I always wonder. I always mean to check to see whether or not visitors can walk in and tour the Hall of Statues in the Capitol anymore. Can you do it anymore? Or are there checkpoints? Are you not allowed to do that? I'd, I'd be willing to bet you probably aren't allowed to just wander in off the street and look around at these things. I bet, I bet you're not allowed to do that, even though the Hall of Statues, the statues themselves, the marble of the floor, the marble of the staircases, the wood, the, the nails, the planks, the metal, 
every last single molecule was paid for by American citizens. There is no rationale of any kind that should bar Americans from being able to wander into the U.S. Capitol and walk around to their heart's content. And yet, I bet, I bet that is the case. I should check and see. But I haven't, I've mailed this book out to a couple of people over the years, but I haven't reread it in quite some time, probably since it originally came out. Uh, was this uh, 2011? Good Lord. Uh, so I might have reviewed it, but I, I'm, it's been a while since I read it. So that was my... Uh, much needed trip to the Brattle. I don't think I'll be back for a week. It's gonna be beastly hot here for the next week uh, But this is give, This will give me plenty to do. We have a biography of Ethan Allen and we have a biography of Cyril Connolly Talk about opposite ends of the biography spectrum <laughs> except they're both huge uh, Then we have the 9-11 wars by a great journalist. Uh, we have India's wars by uh, a Soldier turned writer uh, In fact, I think he wrote India's wars while he was still serving so a, a warrior historian don't see many of those anymore uh, the Oxford Dictionary of uh, of phrase saying and quotation uh, then we have judge on trial by Ivan Klima I, I strongly recommend it if I don't know if this if this translation or some other translation exists anymore in, in print but I strongly recommend the book oh my a, a masterpiece of, of contemporary fiction uh, and two uh, ideal English murder mysteries. <laughs> we have Six Feet Under by Dorothy Simpson and The Killings at Badger's Drift by Carolyn Graham, both of which are, are uh, murder mysteries set in, in seemingly idyllic English country villages. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see what we make of them. Uh, and that, that was my trip to the Brattle. I had a, it was a wonderful, much-needed respite. <laughs> so, and I, again, I don't know how many of these I will keep. I don't know how many of these are available electronically. No idea. I am surprised all the time, every day almost, by by what you all are sending me and what you can't find. Sometimes I'll, I'll have the cheek to make requests. Can you find any? Do you have any of such and such? And sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no. It's a wild west out there in terms of what people have to send me. Like, for instance, Anne McCaffrey has written 500 books. I don't think I've ever got any electronic Anne McCaffrey. The same thing with, with well, general, generally science fiction and fantasy, but older works of history, like the, these 9-11 wars or India's wars, I don't know. Uh, it felt a little strange, I admit, to, to be browsing at the brattle like this, getting books that I don't need, that shelf space I don't have, to lug them back here, uh, keep them clean, maybe find out that a few of these I don't want to keep and and cycle them back to the brattle. All of that felt a little strange because none of that happens with electronic books. That that's all, all that cumbersome stuff is another century. It's electronic books don't you don't have anything like that. You just it, anyway, I'll do I'll do I mean to do an uh, follow-up video on electronic reading just in general. It has been it's been a couple of years since I did one. But in the meantime, a good old-fashioned brattle book haul Nothing beats that. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up for now, but I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.